thank you for joining me this morning and uh, to be able to talk to such a lovely uh, crowd and interesting people. It's a pleasure. Michael, uh, thank you for coming over from Genf. And um, Roland just started this morning and say, stated that we did not, that w we do not have those topics in our papers and in our TV shows that should be relevant at least. What do you think? What, what is your, uh, what would you suggest the media to, um, well, to change or what, what shall they bring their readers so that we actually have those topics in our uh, newspapers? Maybe we get a second one as promised. Thank you. Um, well, part of what I said in, um, in my, my conversation right now, my speech right now, was that um, uh, we are now at a point where the world in 2015 gave itself a new roadmap, that is a collective global roadmap, uh, through what happened in Paris with COP21, what happened with the SDGs, what happened in uh, Japan in March of last year with the reduction of, uh, of the risk of catastrophes, and what happened in, um, in uh, Ethiopia in, in March last year but how we're going to be financing development over the next decades. All of these are coming together um, in their implementation and really provide the global roadmap for us on how we're going to move forward the next at least 15 years, if not more. It covers every aspect of human activity. Um, one, of the, one of my frustrations when I, I look at how um, the world perceives uh, the UN, it's, I have to admit, and I think all of us agree, it's pretty negative. Um, uh, it's asymmetrical, but it's by and large pretty negative. But when you analyze it, you see that that perception is based on a very, very narrow um, bandwidth. It's about the Security Council that doesn't work. It's about a few wars here and there that we can't get to grips with. It's about an Ebola epidemic that we're slow in coming after. It's, it's very specific, but very, a very small percentage of what the system as a whole, not just the UN, but all our partners, um, actually do for humanity every day. As I said at one point, there's not a single person on this planet that isn't touched every day by something that that system does. And I guarantee you that if we close that door tomorrow, all of these people would have a much worse life than they have today. That fact hides, if you want, a multitude of, uh, of, of activities and elements uh, that uh, show and that, uh, that highlight some of the solutions that are being found in order to um, address the problems that we have created ourselves. I, don't, I can speak at length about climate change, but I don't need to because we all know today that, uh, that we are in a serious spot um, in terms of, uh, uh, of environment, in terms of uh, uh, our, the air we breathe, the water we drink, etc. Resources, lack of resources, growing populations. Uh, we are seeing today one of the, res the, the, the results of that We're on migration and refugee issues. So there's a whole panoply of problems that if we really I, I, I manage to implement those goals that we have set ourselves, are going to be, if not solved immediately, certainly mitigated to a very high degree. In order to be able to do that, um, we, every single person, every single organization, this is not just about governments, it's about all of us, have to take responsibility to move this agenda forward. And this can only happen if people know what they're talking about, which is where we, you guys come in, because it has to be a collaborative effort to show, A, where the problems are, but more importantly, to show what the solutions are, so that everybody can come after it. Thank you. Martin, do, do you get upset when you read Der Tagesspiegel? We just had the publisher of that newspaper here. Do you get upset when you see the um, topics that the parliaments in the world, or what the decision makers actually say, do not find their way in the media? Yes, I am. I, I, I am upset uh, because I think that there are a lot of good stories out there. And I'm doubly upset because, uh, again, uh, reporting is one-sided. Uh, just this morning I was looking at media reports on parliaments and out of maybe 20 stories, 19 were negative stories about the comportment of parliaments, the Turkish parliamentarians engaged in a brawl, uh, the expense candles in uh, Uruguay, in South Africa, and the rest. And this has to change. And that is why some of us, our institution is in business. We want to make sure that uh, parliaments uh, change this uh, poor image and attract attention 
from the media for the right reasons. And so there are good stories to tell out there. We have, uh, for instance, when you go to Bangladesh, you see Parliament is very robust in uh, developing legislation to ban ch early child marriage, which is a scourge and uh, has an impact on the lives of uh, young people. You have, uh, when uh, I don't think many of you know that uh, while uh, the bill stocks in the Middle East are stalled, uh, there are parliamentarians from Israel and Palestine sitting in the room uh, discussing how they can build bridges and uh, uh, create an environment that is conducive to the peace talks. These are stories that have to get out there into the media. Uh, and for parliaments to do this, they have to be relevant. They have to live up to uh, some of the uh, uh, standards that have been identified for strong parliaments. For instance, they have to be seen to be representative of society not only in terms of the people in there, but also in terms of the issues. They have to be seen to be transparent in their processes, accountable and accessible to uh, uh, the, the uh, constituents. It's in this way that I think that uh, they can attract the attention of the media for uh, the right uh, reasons. Thank you. Roland, um, this morning you actually talked about that many media makers and journalists uh, do ignore some topics. And, well, we know that the largest newspapers in Europe, for instance, are those that attract readers who want to know about Kim Kardashian and the, her marriage to Kanye West. They want to read uh, what Madonna is doing actually with her son in the UK. And um, do you think we need um, Kate Windsor in the Parliament, so the media actually starts beginning to cover more topics and more um, ideas what the Parliaments are actually doing? Well, first of all, um, if she comes, that's great. I think everybody should come to Parliament because that's our place. So why not her being there as well? Um, but until she comes, there are thousands of other stories for you to cover which are fascinating. For instance, Martin, he has a great database and when you open this database for academics, they come out with fascinating results. Would you know that there's a correlation between women in parliament and GDP growth? Wow, right? Why don't you print it? He has the data. So get in contact with him. There are so many good things and fascinating things happening in Parliament and so many bad things happening in Parliament that I hardly have difficulties to understand why you guys are covering politics only from a governmental perspective, as I showed earlier on. 90%, 95% of the coverage focuses on government and only 5% on Parliament or 10%. We can change that. You can change that. The data are there, the stories are there, every juice is there, so let's just do it. But there's another point which I never understood from my industry, from the media. Let's think we are not media, but we are car industry. Our publishers act as if there is only one car in the world, a Volkswagen Golf. Our publishers act in the way that they would go to Ferrari and tell the Ferrari guys, you are doing everything wrong. You are only selling 10,000 or 15,000 per year. Learn from us, we sell one million. And we all know that wouldn't work. We are so obsessed with the three million, with the 100,000, with the 10 million, and forget that the American market has 300 million. If the audience guys at NBC are proud that they reach seven million, my daily answer to them would be, and what about the 293 million you didn't reach? Why didn't you do your job? I lost my friendship with Franz Schirmacher because I told him the Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung selling every year, and that was those days when they were selling 420,000 copies. I gave him the numbers of Il Sole in Italy, I gave him the number from Wall Street Journal, and I said, if you calculate this for Germany, or the German language Europe, every day you walk out of your building and you sell less than 800,000 copies, that's a lost day. German audience is not less interested, is not less intelligent than the Italians or the Americans. 
a day where the Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung is selling only 400,000 is doing only half of what they could do and what they should do. Sebastian, you are the publisher of the Tagesspiegel. Um, are you able to understand the critic from um, this side? And they are saying that the newspapers do not cover the parliament how they should be. What do you say? I mean, you're trying agenda, you're trying different ways. Um, is there a way for interesting coverage of parliament? Yes. And how are you going to try to reach it and make it interesting that it does not only uh, begin with uh, showing how the uh, laws are changing? I, I guess the, the key observation is, which was indicated in one of the presentations in the morning and yesterday uh, by Thomas Krüger, uh, in, in journalism you can either go on the issues, on the policies, what has to be done to educate certain groups to make things accessible to them, etc. That's the, the policies. Or you focus on the horse race, which is the politics, the methods of getting majorities and getting acceptance. And um, there is a certain pull for the media to focus on the horse race and not on the policies. And the key driver to be more relevant is to focus on the policies. Now, the, the, uh, the, the problem is to judge, to get involved, to really report on policies, you have to be more competent. You have to have more time. You really have to deeply understand it. Occasionally, you have to understand it better than those who are doing politics to cover policies. And um, this uh, brings a challenge to the newspaper, which is to employ and to give time to journalists that are really capable of judging this. Uh, I have to tell you um, a story that, that uh, I ran into when I attended the background uh, meeting of PR and lobby specialists. And the representative of a big German industry, of a big branch, he said, I can hardly find five people in German media who can really thoroughly and competent cover my industry. Now, I didn't know, and this is what I said to him, you have hired 30 people to bullshit in your content marketing department. You took all these guys from the market, now you blame us for not having them employed anymore. You are creating the problem, you are, uh, uh, you are uh, criticizing, you better shut up, you know? and. Um, the, 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 the core um, challenge for the newspapers is to regain, to, to uh, keep aboard, and to have time for them. Now, if you look at newspaper production, newspaper management, and I, I mean, I'm preaching to the choir because you are from that field. If you back, go back 20 years, uh, uh, the same size of an editorial team made one newspaper. They had one deadline. Today, most newspapers, including our own, are not only making one newspaper with a deadline sometime in the uh, late uh, afternoon or in the evening, but we are doing an online service that is working like a radio station. So the same editorial team that has in the past managed to run a newspaper is now running a newspaper and um, radio station, so to say, or it's an online service. And, um, the income from subscription, from advertising in the classified market, from advertising in retail, all is going down. So there is a dramatic economic challenge to find the funds. I gave my answer, innovation, to make it brief, um, to keep up with that. On the other hand, the horse race, of course, is funneled by key institutions. And if you do not cover the horse race, if you do not say the opposition criticize this, then you deserve criticism from the audience. The, 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 the modern open democracy is shaped by checks and balance, by uh, government policies and by opposition criticism. And um, uh, uh, Roland presented quite some contradicting figures. He said, you do not cover the opposition. Covering the opposition means to distribute criticism. That's their job. So um, we are, I, I guess, Complex question, very long answer. 
There is no simple answer. We have to invest in quality, we have to maintain quality, and we have to get to balanced judgments case by case. To give you a piece of constructive news, you, you were asked, this was a very unfair question, um, uh, uh, don't you like Tagesspiegel for having certain kind? You have never read Tagesspiegel, and I'll give you a free subscription. I'll give you a free subscription for a couple of weeks, then you can make up your uh, opinion. But if you look, for instance, as the very, at the very um, intense situation in Germany, having brought into the country one million of refugees within 12 months, without significant public upheaval. You know? In Berlin, you can hardly do your exercise in school because the gymnasiums, the places to do sports in school, are mostly occupied by refugees. You know? That is all accepted by a majority of the population. So there is quite some reporting on the way that is advocating tolerance and, and uh, um, uh, appealing to uh, attitudes that are rather uh, constructive and friendly. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, Jody, what, what do you think? Are the journalists in Europe or all over the world too negative? To, do they just want stories that um, do not bring these kind of topics into the papers, into the media, into the heads of the readers and um, well, t people who watch the TV stations? Um. I can only really speak from the perspective of the consumer because I feel like that's where my, my authority lies, I suppose. So I can't really speak to, to what the industry, um, you know, the reasons that it does what it does. It was, you, you made an interesting point about readers wanting to read, um, you know, the Kim Kardashian stories and perhaps, and I think that's a really important point because news industries are really, um, you know, they chase audience engagement. So where the consumer's attention lies, they think that they're providing that service. Um, but I think a lot, of, a lot of the work that I'm trying to do as well is to educate the consumer, to move them from being a consumer to a conscious consumer, where they are aware of the impact um, that this kind of journalism has on them. So I don't think that it's necessarily an agenda of the journalists to only report negative news. It's just that's, you know, there's that common phrase, if it bleeds, it leads and bad news sells, but really I think that there's a great opportunity to prove um, that there is actually a different way of doing journalism. There is a consumer demand for it. Once you raise consumer awareness, it stimulates and grows this demand for it. And there's an opportunity for news journalists around Europe and the rest of the world to engage in constructive, in constructive journalism um, and bring it into a much more stable component of, of reporting rather than at the moment this kind of niche part of journalism. Martin, um, w what we see in the media right now is that especially in the social media um, many topics come to the readers without um, uh, the newspaper. You know, people who want to influence or who want to um, bring a topic to people sometimes or, or, or many times start using Facebook right away. Do you think that media is losing there, that they should actually understand that the topics that you are representing should be covered, that the media does not lose the way to, um, to the reader? Yeah, I think, I think that uh, uh, the social media can be complementary to the traditional media. It's important because you look at those who are communicating on social media, they are the ordinary citizens like you and I, but those who actually shape public opinion are the traditional uh, media. So the two uh, go hand in hand, and it's important that uh, the traditional media uh, remain relevant. And that takes me back to the, uh, the issue of uh, uh, understanding the respective roles and responsibilities of uh, government, executive government and parliament, because that is where part of the problem is. And I agree with uh, Professor Turner that if you want to do your job very well, then you have to give the journalist enough time to understand the issues, report on the issues uh, objectively. I would say refrain from reporting on the personalities because you encourage bad behavior. Many journalists, uh, no, sorry, many members of parliament uh, tend to grandstand because they know that's the only way they get into the media for the wrong purposes. So it's important that uh, there is a proper understanding of uh, what the role of parliament is in terms of uh, 
making policies, in terms of providing the resources, in terms of holding government accountable, so that you don't see a parliamentarian as the one who is going to build a bridge across the uh, Danube here, but someone who is going to create an environment for building uh, that bridge and making sure that that bridge is built according to certain standards and uh, within certain uh, financial restrictions. So I think it's important that uh, the traditional media don't uh, lose out on social media because you shape this and you have the possibility of uh, forging institutional links with the institutions of governance, including uh, parliament. And if you asked me how you can help raise the profile of parliaments, I think that there is mutual responsibility here. Parliament should be seen to be doing its work effectively, and uh, it should be seen to be reaching out to the uh, media, uh, to inform the media on the facts uh, objectively, and the media, there should be uptake from the media to uh, report on what is happening in Parliament in an objective fashion, uh, focusing on the processes and procedures and not on the sensational uh, negative news that is coming out of Parliament. Because at the end of the day, uh, when you look at the institution, there is no other more legitimate institution of governance than Parliaments that belong to the people, have been elected by the people, and they are the only institutions that can uh, develop policy, uh, hold government accountable, provide the financial resources uh, on the basis of a uh, constitutional deal that is in place in most countries. Thank you. Michael and Martin, are your organizations transparent? Can you really say that when a journalist has a question, he will get the answer and he will even get more? Are you more on the side that you say, no, we will just want to transport those news that we actually uh, want them to cover? My turn. <laughs> uh, the answer is yes, we are. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Hello, please go ahead. We are working hard on becoming much more transparent. What I told you about before with this um, a new uh, portal that we created is, is precisely to, uh, to open up whatever knowledge we have. I think that one of the interesting things of, um, that is going to change in how we do business, not just us, you know, bureaucracies and bureaucrats for the last hundreds of years, certainly the last 70 years, have been rewarded for hoarding information. That was the seat of their power. If we're going to be successful in what we have to do now, we have to do exactly the opposite. We're going to have to reward our staff and our people for sharing information and for figuring out a way to of working much better together. It's a deep uh, intellectual and existential transformation. And the only way we can do it is to um, to do it together and to be held accountable to a much greater degree than we have and to change our narrative and we are in the process of doing that right now. It's a, it's a tall order, it's a Sisyphean task I would say, but we have to do it. Right. Martin? Thank you very much. The answer to is yes. The IPO is an institution that is dedicated to uh, democracy and one of the hallmarks of democracy is transparency in the institutions of governance. So we have nothing to hide. We try to walk the talk ourselves, which means that when you look at our website, sometimes I come out very critical uh, against some parliaments that are wayward in terms of uh, not promoting human rights and uh, uh, pre preaching hate speech, for instance. I do that. And uh, we do name and shame, for instance. Uh, if there is a parliament that is inimical to gender equality, I do not hesitate to uh, condemn uh, such acts. Uh, also, our governing uh, bodies are open to the public. When we hold our governing council, Michael can come in any time, you can come in any time, we're open to journalists. So transparency for us is very important. And the other thing I mentioned was accessibility. We're trying to encourage parliaments to be accessible, not only to the uh, citizen, but also to the media. And this is a very sure way of um, uh, doing away or dispelling the climate of uh, distrust that exists between the media and, and Parliament. So yes, I'm fully supportive of transparency and uh, we're doing everything daily to make sure that the institution, the umbrella institution of Parliament, the IPU, and Parliament individually walk the talk. 
Thank you. Sebastian, your paper, your newspaper is based in Berlin. And um, what do your journalists say when they come back from the parliament? And to, do they get all the news and all the information they need to do their work? Um, uh, parliaments are usually a source where you get all the information because you have an opposition that is has an incentive to uh, communicate um, the other side. Uh, What, what I really want to applaud to is your initiative to make data available. Uh, you may know an, an initiative called the European Journalism Fund, based, I guess, in Denmark. And um, they bring together from all European states, European Union states, they bring together individual journalists to analyze European Union data. For instance, they analyzed who is receiving agricultural funds, so for uh, nutrition and all that stuff. And they found out, for instance, that the largest recipients of agricultural funds of the European Union are UK billionaire families. You know? And uh, the data are there. It needs the institutions to allow access, and then it needs the media to provide the knowledge and the competence uh, to really uh, analyze these data. And maybe you can even do more, not only by giving access to the data, but by encouraging informatics, computer scientists, uh, to, to uh, look at them and analyze them. Because that is usually um, a resource and a competency that is less uh, available in media. Uh, Tagesspiegel has just, I indicated, has hired six people who are doing nothing but computer analysis and data journalism. And they are doing very well because all of a sudden you don't only have this four column piece on how is uh, children education going on, but you can analyze um, uh, district by district how is language um, uh, understanding improving over the past years. And all of a sudden you have positive news, which are real news because you can really document how a district by st district are things are improving and you can highlight those who did well and, and the like. So I encourage you to go on and even do more by providing the, 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 the uh, IT knowledge to get access. Can I just answer this? Please. Um, I, I mentioned it earlier, we're actually doing that. Um, but let me just step back a bit. One of the things I'm trying to do is to establish a sustainable dialogue with media outlets. I'm not particularly interested in seeing your journalist or somebody else's journalist once in a blue moon for an interview. That's very nice, but it doesn't really cut it. So we have to have a conversation that goes over and establishes a trust we're talking about. And that means that you get access to our data. You can get access raw, or you can get access to it um, worked, depending on your very specific needs or the needs of your writers. We have, together with Media Tenor, a bunch of scientists around the world who will do that. And it is at your, uh, you know, uh, it's for you to use. Um, it's not particularly uh, enormous, as a, as a, but it will be driven by need. Um, and um, as with many other things in the UN these days, we do all these things without a budget, but you know, that's beside the point. Actually, it's a piece of news that you may want to talk about. But, um, so we are doing it, and we are very keen to make sure that uh, that happens. But the very fact that we are, you know, that we are not only opening um, the data um, because actually a lot of it is open source, it's just a matter of figuring out where it is, which is why we did this, this portal. But also to act as a, as a, as a, as a funnel um, to people. Um, one of the many complaints I get from journalists is that they don't have access to the head of WHO, to this and that. Well, we can help with that, and we do. Thank you. Roland, you did bring something that you usually don't have with you normally. What, what did you bring? Why? Well, when I told my wife that I'm going to speak about Coca-Cola, she says, you're not allowed to do that. So I said, well, maybe I can compensate the Coca-Cola stuff with something else. Um, you might have rec recognized that Ulrich is not here. He says hello to all of you, but unfortunately he couldn't make it. But in all bad things, there are good things. I learned last week that Michael says he's never ever being on a panel without a woman. So when Ulrich couldn't make it, I said, Why is Jody not coming? So I think that worked out perfect. The, the other guy we are really missing is the Grand Mufti of Egypt. Um, and he becomes a victim of his success on one part.
because when he started the initiative, Ban Ki-moon and Michael Muller, on um, fighting intolerance and, and this whole um, horrible part of um, uh, the killing and the murder um, done in the name of whatever religion, um, he did it in such a good way and the response he got was so tremendous that the Egyptian president invited him um, to not only give the keynote at the opening of the, European, of the Egyptian parliament, but he is now chairman of several um, legislatory changes within Egypt and unfortunately all these final parts of getting these um, new laws in place takes, happens this week so he couldn't come. Therefore, we have this apple in order to overcome stereotypes. Because if you have met the Grand Mufti, you would realize um, he is everything but for sure not the leader of the world's largest terrorism organization. The artist Neves from Switzerland, she uses this apple to let everybody of us learn it's a pom grenade. I had to remember to say it's not an apple, it's a pom grenade. Because the pom grenade is the only fruit which is existing in all parts of the world and in all religions. It's, it's a symbol of positive things for all of us, whether we are Muslims or we are Catholics or Protestants or whatsoever. So in order to at least have a little bit of the Grand Mufti around and overcoming stereotyping, here is the pom grenade. And as a, everything is about symbols, you can make a picture of yourself with Nevis or without over there showing that it starts with a little bit to overcome stereotypes. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. Gentlemen, thanks for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, short break. <laughs>